Now let's get to some other new faces and let's switch categories. Those were my most important slash most interesting first year rebuilders. Luke Fickle, Matt Rule, and Deion Sanders. Now let's get to some first year shoe fillers, right? Replacements. I don't want to call them replacements, even though I did like the movie. Shane Falco. Wasn't that Shane Falco on the replacements? Do I get a nod? I got a thumbs up over there. Shane Falco. There we go. Uh, although, although, hot take, Keanu better as Johnny Utah than he was Shane Falco, right? Yeah, now we know. So now everyone 35 and older is like, there we go. Johnny Utah reference. Um, first year shoe fillers. Uh, I've got seven. There's probably a, a couple more I could have thrown in here, but I've got seven first year shoe fillers. What is this category? This category are players or groups of players that have to replace some of the biggest names or most important contributors in the sport from a year ago. So these are teams that are going to rely heavily on brand new faces, first year faces in really important key spots, shoe fillers. Here we go. Uh, let's start with the seventh over there. And I didn't rank these. It's just like seven spots. Okay. So don't come at me about ranking Carson Steele and Dante Moore at UCLA. Um, if you look at what UCLA was a year ago, uh, this was a team led by their running back, Zach Charbonnet, led by their quarterback, Dorian Thompson Robinson. And these two guys are basically brought in to replace those two guys. Now, do we know that it's going to be Dante Moore, the freshman quarterback? No, we don't know that it's going to be Dante Moore. I think it's going to be eventually. Okay. And then Carson Seal transfers in and here's a guy that... He's going to have to replace Charbonnet, who was one of the better running backs in the entire country. And if you look at what UCLA was, they were a physical running team, and that's where they're going to have to lead on. Charbonnet led the nation in scrimmage yards per game last year with 168. He could catch it out of the backfield. He was versatile. He was smart. He was a great team player. The duo, Charbonnet and Dorian Thompson-Robinson, had over 2,000 rushing yards a year ago on a team that really needs to run the ball well. They had 5,000 total yards. DTR has been a five-year starter. Right as, as Chip Kelly has built this and they finally got over that hump last year of being really competitive at the top end, a lot of that was because of the veteran running back and the veteran quarterback. And so now here we go. We got a transfer and a freshman. Now, it should be noted that Kelly's, what was that, his first year? I think it was his first year. DTR was the quarterback, but only after the first couple of games. In fact, he made his first start in game two of his freshman season, a game that Gus and I called at Oklahoma. I don't know if it's going to be right away, but I do believe Dante Moore eventually will become the starting quarterback for UCLA. That's why those guys are my my shoe fillers there, and they, they made the list. At number six, it's another group. It's the Michigan offensive line. Now, to be fair, there are guys that are back on this offensive line, and there are new faces. So I just put them in there kind of as, as, a, as a group, okay? Um, this... This offensive line has been, you could argue, one of. Now, they've won the Joe Moore Award as the top offensive line in the country each of the last two years, but they've been one of the best offensive lines in each of the last two years. They've won the Big Ten. They've beaten Ohio State. They've been run-oriented. They've been physical. They have owned the game at the line of scrimmage basically for two straight years. So the bar is very high. They've got Zach Zinter back, Trevor Keegan back. Uh, they both could have gone to the NFL. They stayed. All right. They're going to have five seniors on the offensive line. They added a couple of really good transfers that a lot of programs were after. Um, Ladarius Henderson from Arizona State, really good player. Um, Drake Nugent from Stanford, a couple of Stanford guys in there. This is going to be a really deep offensive line. Okay, and you've got two of the best running backs in tandem behind them. You've got an experienced quarterback behind them. You've got some good tight ends uh, on the outside. I think that we're going to see an offensive line that's going to be relied on to do a little bit of what Stanford used to do with like six and seven offensive linemen in the game. Sharon Moore is their offensive coordinator. He no longer has to share those duties with Matt Weiss, who's no longer there. So Sharon Moore, who's the offensive line coach and now play caller on a full-time basis, can exercise some real power with his offensive linemen, the guys he knows best, by putting them in the game. They can rely on a sixth or seventh offensive line. Remember when Stanford used to do that? They would coin that term like intellectual brutality. They would bring in all those extra linemen and they would run power and gap and just bludgeon people 
people. And guess what they did? They shortened game and games and they made it stress free on their offense and more specifically their defense. I think because they can rotate, they're probably going to be more fresh at the end of the season. And it's not going to be hard because their schedule is one of the easiest schedules in college football, them in Georgia, who are also the number one and two teams in the country to begin the year. That's a whole nother story and probably a whole nother podcast. But this offensive line, you got some first year shoe fillers in there from a transfer perspective. If they're as good as what they've been in the past, then the Big Ten goes through Ann Arbor. What they've done against Penn State and Ohio State, running the ball in the second half each uh, each of those games last year, was staggering. 250 and 246. Those are the yards rushing in just the second half against Ohio State and Penn State a year ago. So unless those teams can do something to stop this offensive line, then Michigan's going to win the Big Ten again, right? You see where I'm going with that. Uh, let's go to, to number five. This is an offensive coordinator. And these are big shoes to fill. Huge, 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 huge. Garrett Riley leaves for Clemson. TCU needs another offensive coordinator, so they go with Kendall Bryles. Interesting. Interesting. A little different styles. Um, Bryles obviously familiar with that area. We all, I, we all know. I think that this... I think if we're being honest, this this raised some eyebrows. But he takes over for Garrett Riley uh, with this Sonny Dykes offense. This was a top ten top ten offense in the country a year ago in terms of scoring. They're losing their most important contributors: Max Duggan, Heisman finalist, runner up actually; Kendra Miller, one of I thought the best running backs in particular with his versatility in the entire country; Quentin Johnston, unbelievable matchup wide receiver that can go down and just physically beat people down the field an all American on the offensive line and Steve Avila. They're replacing a lot of players and their offensive coordinator. I think what I'm trying to say is like this TCU team might not be as good as we think they are. Now I believe in Sonny Dykes. I really do. And Chandler Morris is a talented player. Remember, he beat out Max Duggan to start the year a year ago until he got hurt, and then Duggan took his job from him. I just, th this, this is a wait and see early. These are huge shoes to fill. This is very intriguing for me. How is Kendall Bryles and this offense going to look early in the year after those three years when he was the OC at Arkansas? Um, all right, number four is another group. You could argue that this should be, I should wait until number one, but whatever. It's a group, so there wasn't one like one specifically. How about the the first year shoe fillers at Ohio State, Georgia, Alabama? All of them have new offensive coordinators and new quarterbacks. Every single one of them. <laughs> it's like, think about that for a moment. These are three of the top four teams in the country. These are this is the defending two time national champion. It's the only team that looked like they had a chance against Georgia a year ago in Ohio State. And it's an Alabama team that just leaned, leaned on the top pick in the draft and Bryce Young for two straight years. These are massive replacements. Don't know exactly who it's going to be at all these places, but you look at what these teams are replacing – these three were the top five scoring offenses in the country. They all scored 40 plus points a game. Those three starting quarterbacks at each of those places. This is what they combined for last year. A hundred passing touchdowns and 18 interceptions. That's staggering. Okay. So now you've got to think of this and they're like, okay, moving forward, let's rank these three. Which ones are you worried about? Which ones are you not worried about? Let's start with the one that I'm not really worried about. I would lead that with Ohio State. Why do you say Ohio State? Because they've got Ryan Day. So even though you've got Brian Hartline, who's technically a new offensive coordinator, even though you've got a new quarterback, whether it's Kyle McCord or some, some other player there, you still have Ryan Day. And if you look at his track record, there's two things that jump out to me. One is that he has had, really, for the majority of his career, he's had first-year quarterbacks, brand-new starters. It wasn't until the last two starters that he had, Justin Fields and C.J. Stroud, that he actually had a second year with those two players. Okay, so you can assume, I think, on, on pretty good ground and, and strong grounds 
that the quarterback will be fine regardless of who it is. You just saw some pictures, if you're watching on YouTube, of Brian Hartline. Well, why am I not concerned about Brian Hartline as a new offensive coordinator? Because Ryan Day is still right there. Ryan Day could be like, hey, now's the time for that shot play. He's on the headset as well. So am I all that concerned about the new year of a first-year shoe filler at Ohio State? No, not really. In fact, if you're going to be a first-year shoe filler as a play caller or a quarterback, where do you want to do it? At Ohio State, with Ryan Day looking over it and throwing to Marvin Harrison Jr. on the outside. Okay, so there they would be number one georgia would be next why because they're not quarterback centric as good as bennett was they're not a quarterback centric program okay they, they don't rely on their quarterback to be a a world beater or a superman it's not a cent quarterback centric program so it doesn't really matter they're about roster. They're about culture. They're about speed and athleticism, and they still have that. One of the best rosters, if not the best roster in college football. The one, and I won't go to like worried status, but the one that I would just put behind those two is Alabama. And the reason is, is because they don't have a great core of wide receivers to throw to, and I don't believe that they are all that confident in what they have at the quarterback position. Now, they might be now, but the fact that their no offensive coordinator, Tommy Reese, had to go out and get not just a transfer quarterback, but the transfer quarterback that he knew best in Tyler Buckner to come in after spring ball tells you that during spring ball, they were not happy with what happened at quarterback. That's just, you have to assume that that was the case. So now Tommy Reese has to be a play caller under Nick Saban, which presents its own challenges. And they're not settled at the quarterback position even after spring. And whoever they do settle on at quarterback, whether it's Tyler Buckner or Milrow, they've got to throw to a set of wide receivers that severely underachieved a year ago. So that's why if I was going to be nervous or if I were to rank these of like, you know, uh, in terms of what do I expect from these new faces, new shoe fillers, I expect a lot of greatness from Ohio State and even Georgia and Alabama that would be the one I would be a little bit concerned with all right let's move on to number three number three uh Will Stein Will Stein is an offensive coordinator that now is going to be at Oregon and he's got to replace Kenny Dillingham Kenny Dillingham was excellent they were a really good offense and Dillingham was a bit of a Bo Nix whisperer in fact Bo Nix's best two seasons in college football were with Kenny Dillingham, first at Auburn and then at Oregon. Um, he still has the run game, but they've got to replace four new offensive linemen up front. Stein comes from UTSA. Uh, Dillingham now goes to Arizona State as a head coach. That's a huge new face shoe filler position because Oregon's got a lot of expectations. They feel like they can win the Pac-12. They, they feel like they can go and make a playoff push. A lot of it depends on Will Stein, the young new offensive coordinator there in Eugene. Remember, this was a top 10 scoring team in the country last year, so it's not going to be easy, but that's a great, you know, like not many people know the Will, name Will Stein, but this is a first year shoe filler that's very important in college football. At number two, I'll go with and really, it's a group, but I'm going to go with a guy that's that's singular here, C.J. Baxter. He's the very talented freshman running back at Texas, and he's got to replace B. John Robinson, the nation's num number one running back recruit, C.J. Baxter, replacing the nation's number one running back in B. John Robinson. Uh, B. John... This one's interesting because B. John didn't get a ton of carries as a true freshman, in particular in his first six games. So I don't necessarily think that C.J. Baxter is going to come in and set the world on fire right away um, as, as a first-year player. But eventually, what we saw in Bijan's first season was that he was the best player on the field at the end of the year. Torched Kansas State, torched Colorado in the bowl game. And I, like that's probably what you're going to start to get. Now, there's other guys there. Jonathan Brooks is there. Uh, Jaden Blue is there. They're going to get a lot of carries there. But this is an offense that has 10 starters back. So whoever takes the snaps at running back, maybe it's C.J. Baxter or these other guys early, but maybe Baxter later in the season, their contribution and the what they can do for this offense is so important because Bijan was so important. The way that he caught it out of the backfield, his explosiveness. If they can replace Bijan, 
with a host of these guys and these first year, year shoe fillers come in and actually fill the shoes, then watch out for Texas. If they do, if Baxter is a player into the year, they could be playing for and winning the Big 12 championship. But we're not talking about Texas till they do something. You got that? Do you hear me, Texas? You got to earn it. You got to earn it on this show. Um, all right. Now, now my, you could say that my most important shoe fillers, and that's at USC. You've got to replace Jordan Addison and Travis Dye, and they're going to do that with Dorian Singer, the transfer from Arizona, and Mar Marshawn Lloyd, the transfer running back. Now, Austin Jones is also there, right? So <clears throat> he got some carries after Dye went down a year ago. But I would just say, like, Caleb Williams, I think we would all agree, is the best player in college football. He is the Heisman Trophy winner, and rightly so. And, and these guys have to come alongside, and they have to produce at a high level. Now, I will say, it's not like Addison set the world on fire last year, but he was the Bolitnikoff Award winner from the previous season. He drew a lot of attention. Travis Dye, he was a workhorse. He gained a lot of yards. So what they did is that they took the pressure off of Caleb Williams to a large extent, defensive looks, production, all of those things got a little easier for Caleb Williams. These guys have to do that for Williams this year because everybody is going to be gearing their entire defensive plan to Caleb Williams. How do we stop him? How do we corral him? How do we keep him in the pocket? He's got to have guys around him that step up and play well. And if they do, watch out for SC. This was a team within a breath of a playoff birth last year and they will be again this year in particular if Dorian Singer and Marshawn Lloyd show up and play uh, like we think that they possibly can all right so there you go there's my shoe fillers thank you for watching the Joel Class Show YouTube channel and if you like this clip make sure to like it and subscribe to the channel and you can stay up to date on all of my college football coverage